Hey everybody, I just want to do a sound check uh, and make sure that you can hear me. If you can raise your hand to let me know that my voice is coming through on the GoToWebinar application, that is, not in reality. Uh, thanks. Okay, great. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us for a GSA schedule. What's in it for you? Before we start, I just want to briefly uh, cover who we are at Virginia PTAC as a sponsored program of George Mason University. Jennifer, if you can go to the next slide there. Thanks. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Torrens, and I'm the Operations Manager of the Virginia Procurement Technical Assistance Center. We provide technical assistance and training to both small and large businesses about state, federal, and local government topics. This Procurement Technical Assistance Center is funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the Defense Logistics Agency. Uh, here at the Virginia PTAC at GMU, we offer many free services to small and large businesses, including training, one-on-one -on -one counseling, and events. In addition to the free counseling, we offer our Virginia-based clients. We also have an inexpensive subscription bid match service, and you can find more information about this on our website. Primary takeaway I want you to understand is that our events and training are free and open to anyone, but the one-on-one -on -one counseling and bid match service are limited to our official clients, those Virginia-based government contractors in our region. If you understand that, then you can understand how to utilize our services. PTACs are regional or statewide, so with over 94 of them nationally, you'll have a local PTAC who can offer assistance if you're interested in one-on-one -on -one counseling and outside of our area. For more information, I'd encourage you to familiarize yourself, yourself with our website at virginiaptac.org or the aptac-us.org website, and you can find uh, their contact information there. Um, before we st start uh, the presentation, I just wanted to mention a couple of housekeeping notes. We're going to make the slides available to attendees. And during Q&A, uh, please type your questions with enough context that Jennifer can follow up with you afterward as needed. Um, we don't get them to address during class, but we are going to stop at the end of each section to address questions as we go. And we'll be taking attendance during the session. Slides will be accessible for you when you're marked as attended. Uh, now that the housekeeping's done, I'd like to introduce your instructor today, Jennifer Schaus, a longtime friend of the Virginia PTAC, who's been speaking on this topic for our clients for many years. Jennifer provides consulting on GSA schedule matters, federal business development, and marketing with her firm, Jay Schausen Associates. With 20 years experience, Jennifer is a well-known speaker at many events in Northern Virginia and the DC region, and sits on the board of directors for Govlish LLC and the uh, SAMe Society of American Military Engineers. Jennifer, you can take it away. Super, thank you so much, Elizabeth, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we've got about two hours together, uh, so we're gonna run through some content slides. Uh, and then, as, Eliz as Elizabeth stated, please type your questions into the right-hand side panel box, and I will answer those. All questions are anonymous, so uh, don't feel like there is any stupid question. Uh, the way the agenda is laid out, I'll try to address your questions for that particular topic. And then anything that um, is kind of outside of those parameters, I'll address at the end. Uh, and then if there's anything that uh, we don't have time for, as Elizabeth mentioned, I'm happy to answer those after the class. Um, quick blurb about us, uh, just kind of reiterating what Elizabeth mentioned. We're based in downtown DC and provide a variety of professional services for both product service and software firms. Uh, we've got actually now over 450 complimentary webinars, all on federal contracting. You can find those on our website and also on our YouTube channel. Um, just to let you guys know, we do have a series that we cover on the DFARS, which is uh, the Defense Federal um, Acquisition Regulations. Those are every Wednesday at noon. Uh, a little bit dry, and they're usually covered, dry material, and usually covered by government contracts attorneys. Uh, we go sequentially through the DFARS. There's 52 parts, 52 weeks in the year. So, uh, as I mentioned, then every Wednesday those are covered. Uh, last year we covered the FAR. So if you guys ever run across any uh, FAR regulations that you're unsure about, uh, you can find PowerPoints and all of the webinars again on our website, uh, as well as the YouTube channel. Uh, separate from that, we have a monthly series that covers more of the strategic and tactical topics in government contracting. These are the second Friday of every month. So we've got one tomorrow at noon covering proposal writing, and then you can see the other topics uh, throughout the year. We wrap up in December with mergers and acquisitions and government contracting. Uh, and I believe that uh, PTAC uh, attendees or PTAC uh, customers do receive a discount code for these. Uh, so instead of uh, the regular price, I believe you'll get a, a discount. Okay. Uh, so for our agenda today, I'm just going to give you a quick overview about GSA. We'll go through the basics, the process, 
the three components of the proposal, uh, the timeline, so you understand should you decide to go down this path, um, it will help you more with the planning process. And then once you're on the schedule, some of the best practices for a post award. Okay, so we'll dig in here with the overview. Uh, just a quick blurb on who GSA is. It's the General Services Administration, uh, headquartered in downtown Washington, D.C. They're a non-appropriated agency, which basically means that they do not receive any taxpayer funding. So uh, they receive funding through uh, both sides of the house. So GSA has both the PBS, which is the public building service. So they are the largest real estate in the DC metro area. So any of the government buildings that you go into, GSA is the landlord. National parks, monuments, uh, GSA again is uh, the landlord there. Uh, and sometimes that would be in partnership with Department of Interior and others. But for today's purposes, we're gonna be talking about the other side, uh, which is the contract vehicles. Uh, they also maintain the uh, public website. So SAM.gov, uh, back in the day, FPDS, gov, uh, usaspending.gov, and where you get a lot of the uh, market intelligence. Okay, so some basics uh, about the GSA schedule. It is a, only a contract vehicle and a marketing tool. It is absolutely, and I should put this in red, not required at all to do business with the government. Um, so more or less, you're, you're issued a ticket to the dance, but you're still going to need to build relationships to find a dance partner, somebody to work with, somebody to purchase your product, services, or software through the schedule. Uh, and I'm going to pull up a chart. It's a couple slides uh, into this presentation, but it's only used, the GSA schedule is only used about 10 to 15 percent of the time in federal government purchases. And that's an average. So if you're selling uh, bulletproof vest, that number may be completely different. But on average, if we looked at all of the government spending uh, and put it into a pie chart. And like I said, you'll see this visual in a couple slides. Uh, GSA is a pretty narrow lane. It still represents billions of dollars, um, but it's not the only way that the government purchases. GSA just does a really good job of marketing themselves. So that's why a lot of uh, companies think that they need the schedule. Um, or that it's the preferred method of, of purchase. Uh, many agencies and departments actually have their own contract vehicles. Uh, so you've got Navy Seaport E, you've got NASA Soup, and the lists go on and on and on. Um, and we'll talk about that uh, in more detail a little bit later. As far as uh, companies that hold the schedule, you've got about 18 to 20,000 uh, vendors that are on the schedule. And more than half of them, I think it's roughly now about 63% have zero sales through the schedule. Now, they may have a uh, $5 million contract with the Air Force or Department of Commerce or uh, Department of Ag, uh, but through the schedule, that number is zero. So what does that tell us? It tells us that either somebody sold them something that uh, they didn't need or the company had a build it and they will come strategy, which really isn't a strategy. It means that they haven't done their homework to understand what's the preferred method of procurement for your particular customer. Um, the whole focus, 99% of what the GSA schedule is focused on is for GSA to secure your absolute lowest prices. So you'll have to make a lot of pricing disclosures, uh, who you have given your lowest prices to, uh, the frequency um, and additional details, and then offer GSA something that is equal to or lower than your lowest price. In addition to that, uh, once they have GSA has negotiated your lowest price, your GSA rates then are only a price ceiling, meaning that once you're on the schedule, as you start bidding for work through your schedule, uh, you will typically come in at lower rates than your GSA rate. Uh, so your margins, your profits uh, will be lower. And I was not an econ major in college, um, but uh, lower margins will typically, in order for you to be successful, you're then going to need heavy volume. So unless you have a full pipeline of opportunities uh, that indicate that your potential customer is going to buy a ton of um, uh, work, product, services, software through the schedule, uh, you may want to do the math first. Uh, and I'm going to point you to some websites that will allow you to do some homework to make sure that 
you're not wasting your time or money or getting boxed into lowest uh, prices. Uh, there also are price restrictions. This is all the fine print uh, post award. So uh, as I mentioned, your GSA rates are a price ceiling only. And then uh, through your schedule, you'll be encouraged to give lower rates. Outside of your schedule, you cannot give lower rates. So again, you will be uh, restricted. So if McDonald's comes to you or Department of Commerce comes to you and these are not uh, GSA scheduled purchases, you cannot offer discounts lower than your GSA rate. Uh, the GSA schedule can be used by all of uh, the federal government departments and agencies. Uh, can also be used by quasi-government entities, meaning uh, the World Bank, the Red Cross, the IMF, the IFC, uh, IADB, and there are some state and local governments who will grandfather in with uh, some paperwork uh, your GSA schedule. So, for example, California has something called the California Multiple Awards Schedule, uh, typically referred to just by the acronym CMAS or CMAS, Again, California Multiple Awards Schedule. Texas also has something called TexMass. So again, Texas Multiple Awards Schedule. And as I mentioned, through um, some forms and hoops to jump through, they will work with you to um, pull in your GSA schedule rates. Uh, the whole focus of being on a contract vehicle is so that the entity maintaining the vehicle, in this uh, case, GSA, ensures that you have done this type of work before, that you're vetted, that your prices have been negotiated, and then that way when the uh, contracting officer or the program manager is getting ready to purchase your product or services, uh, they know that all that due diligence has been done and they can just go direct up to a certain dollar threshold. Uh, but really, again, the focus is on your lowest price, so you wanna be cognizant of that. Uh, and there's a question that came in and I'm going to save until later. So let me just uh, continue moving on here to our next slide. Um, so I, uh, I've got the picture here of uh, Rodney Dangerfield, who uh, is famous for uh, not getting any respect. Uh, and the GSA schedule can, um, on a positive note, uh, provide uh, a little bit more of a status uh, symbol for you, showing that uh, you have been vetted. Uh, GSA does then provide that additional marketing exposure. Uh, back in the day, they would host some industry events for certain industries um, or industry-specific events. So, you know, for all the IT vendors, they would have a um, kind of, I'll call it a mini trade show where they would invite the vendors to have a table, uh, just as you would in a trade show. And then the attendees would be the government agencies that needed those products or services. Uh, you also will get uh, some advance notice or we'll say special kind of RFPs, uh, requests for proposals that uh, are only visible to the GSA schedule holders. Um, this is good and bad. GSA is working on some transparency. Uh, I'm not sure where they are in the rollout phase, but uh, they will be making these RFPs and RFQs uh, open to the public as far as uh, visually uh, being able to see them, which will help make your decision on getting the schedule or not a little bit easier. Um, but the only people that would be able to respond would be the GSA schedule holders. So it uh, then helps to uh, limit some of your competition. However, I would put a, a caveat here or a little bit of a warning or red flag that says, as you see these RFPs coming in through the GSA uh, portal, Yes, the competition is uh, limited just to those GSA schedule holders, but very similar to what you see um, on SAM.gov now, uh, most of these opportunities have been worked and wired, meaning that somebody has been in there for anywhere from nine to 18 months at least to cultivate a relationship, to uh, work with the agency, to understand their needs, and work with them to shift that RFP, that opportunity, that solicitation, uh, and moving it from perhaps going out to everybody on SAM.gov to then being a GSA schedule purchase, which again will limit the competition. 
So you can't just expect that because the opportunity is showing up on uh, the GSA eBuy site, which is where these um, RFPs uh, are pushed out through, that this opportunity was written for you and it's, you know, it's right in your industry, it's right in your wheelhouse. Yes, it'll be in your industry, um, but if you did not have a prior relationship uh, with whoever is pushing out the opportunity, then it's probably just a wasted exercise in proposal writing. Uh, the real way to work these again is through relationships that take anywhere from on the short side, we'll say nine months, on the longer side, 18 to 24 to 36 months. So it's just a, a more narrow avenue to limit your competition. As far as the process, and this is um, really just kind of doing some of this homework and, and market research to understand, is this really the right path uh, for your company based on pricing, based on what your, who your ideal customer is and what their preferred method of procurement is? Uh, as I mentioned, GSA is one of many, many, many contract vehicles that are out there. So it is a, a fairly narrow choice. Uh, and this is the part that I was talking about that is probably um, perhaps the most important slide that we're going to focus on today. So uh, again, these are just averages. This is not based on uh, IT services. It's not based on somebody selling bulletproof vests. It's not based on management consulting. This is just a, a high level average overview of how the government purchases. Um, so full and open competition, and what I'm doing is starting on the, the left-hand side, and I'm going to work my way down the list. Uh, and full and open competition, uh, this is basically any opportunity that you will see on SAM.gov that anybody with a, an internet connection can see and respond to. Um, again, most of those have also been worked and wired, but and anybody with the internet connection can respond to that as long as you meet the requirements of the solicitation. Uh, the second one down are the department or agency vehicles. So as I mentioned, um, Navy Seaport E, NASA Soup, HHS has their own contract vehicles. State Department has their own. Everyone pretty much has their own. So uh, you also want to do some homework and due diligence there to understand is your customer uh, using that procurement, that agency-wide um, or department-wide contract vehicle or some other mechanism to buy your specific services. Uh, GSA schedule, I just kind of took 12% uh, based on the, the 10 to 15% average. Set-asides uh, come in at about 15%. Again, these are all very rough averages. Um, and so this will be your 8A, woman-owned, veteran-owned, hub zone, and all the other check boxes. Um, and so they do obviously represent a, a significant portion of how the government purchases. Uh, simplified acquisitions, uh, these are small business uh, procurements. Uh, if you just, um, and they're basically another mechanism that the government uses to purchase. Uh, sole source, this is going to be uh, when there is only one um, source of supply on the planet. Uh, this is very rare and, and typically opens you up to a lot of protest. Um, but if you have something that is so unique that nobody else has, uh, and usually will tend to be some sort of technology um, uh, component or, or service. Um, second from the bottom here is OTA. These are other transaction authorities. These are non-FAR, so they're not regulated by the Federal Acquisition Regulations uh, purchases. And these this number might actually be closer to three or even four or five percent. These have really skyrocketed in the last few years. Uh, OTAs uh, are used typically or only by, I believe it's uh, Department of Energy, uh, Transportation, DOD, and I believe HHS. If you want to uh, learn more about OTAs, we have a section on our website uh, under, if you navigate over to webinars and everything is segmented there by topic, you'll find multiple webinars on OTAs. Uh, and then other would be other um, uh, procurement methods. Um, so the real focus of this slide is just to show you that GSA is simply an option and it's a pretty narrow option um, and, and a choice. It's not mandated. Nobody needs to use the schedule. Uh, it's, again, one of many uh, procurement methods. We've got a couple of questions. Let me just review them to see if they are um, 
relevant here. The simplified acquisitions, like I said, uh, those are a small business set aside. Uh, I believe the number is for procurements under, it's either 250,000 or 350,000. I think the number changed recently. Uh, for construction contracts, I believe it's either 850 or 750. If you want more information on that, again, on our website, if you navigate to the webinars topic and scroll down to simplified acquisitions, you'll find a plethora of webinars on that specific topic. Uh, next question is um, why there are so few small business entrants into the federal arena. Uh, we'll save that for later. Uh, and the other one I think we're going to save for later as well. Yeah. Okay, let's uh, keep moving here. I'll save these for the end. I just want to kind of stay on points so that we don't run out of time and I can make it through the slides. Um, so as far as that homework and market research, you also want to look at how your prices compare to other vendors. And this is really the most important part uh, of this is setting your prices. Um, so for products, you can do some homework on the gsaadvantage.gov site. Uh, and if you're selling services, meaning labor, so hourly rates for program managers, systems engineers, uh, whatever it is, you can go to the calc.gsa.gov site. And again, we will make all of these slides available. Uh, the session today is being recorded. So if you're taking feverish notes, that's fine. But if you wanna go back and listen to the recording, uh, we will send that out to you as well. So if we look at pricing, this is a screenshot from the calc.gsa.gov site. And what I did, if you can see at the top there, it says hourly rate data for project manager. So I typed in, project manager, because I figured that would be something that most companies, regardless of what you're selling, uh, probably have. And then on the right-hand side, you have additional filters. And so you really wanna make sure that you're comparing apples to apples. So this is going to give you rates of the other GSA schedule holders who also have a project manager. And let's just use this hypothetical example with a bachelor's degree and a minimum of five years of experience. So the average GSA rate is $140. Now let's say your project manager who has a bachelor's degree and five years of experience is $240. Well, I don't think you'd be profitable uh, being on the schedule because your rate would be chopped by $100 and that uh, is probably gonna put you out of business because as you start bidding for work through the schedule at 140, you're probably gonna be uh, in order to be competitive, you'll probably need to come in at a rate of 136, 135, or somewhere in that neighborhood. So do this homework before you decide that the GSA schedule is definitely for you. Uh, and this next slide is just further down on the page. I didn't wanna try to scrunch everything onto one. I wanted you guys to be able to see uh, what the page looked like and, and the data that's returned. You can also export this into Excel and play around with the numbers. Um, so as you scroll further down uh, the page, you'll get a listing of all of the vendors that this data was pulled from. Again, so anyone that shows up with at least a minimum of five years of experience that holds the title project manager. The contract vehicle on the right-hand side, you will also want to select uh, the correct contract vehicle. So you wanna make sure if you're selling furniture that, um, and it's a project manager for that particular schedule that you're not looking at uh, the IT schedule or, or some other um, segment of the schedule. And this is just further uh, a screenshot of scrolling further down the page. Again, this is from the calc, C-A-L-C dot G-S-A dot gov site that lets you compare labor categories or job titles. Okay, looks like there is another question. Let's see here. Uh, Oh, what is the site for the GSA prices? Again, it's calc, C-A-L-C dot G-S-A dot gov. And for products is G-S-A advantage dot G-O-V. Okay, so as far as the homework, and it really will pay off to do some homework before you decide to go down the path. You wanna make sure that you meet, but preferably exceed all of the qualifications and the basic requirements with a solicitation, read the solicitation, um, hire somebody, work with your PTAC, work with us, um, 
your attorney, whoever it is, your accountant, uh, to make sure that uh, you do meet all of the requirements. And just because you meet the requirements does not mean that it's a good decision for your company. You also then want to do this homework about the, the pricing, uh, making sure there are going to be opportunities that you can bid on, making sure that your pipeline has uh, customers or potential customers that prefer to purchase from the schedule and not anything else in that pie chart. Um, and that's you know a basic uh, math operation, and it's not there's not a cookie cutter um, Q and A for each company. It depends on where you have these relationships. Uh, the schedule also, as a FYI here, is an open and rolling what I'll call request for proposal, meaning that uh, it's a solicitation that will have updates, uh, which GSA will call refreshes from time to time. So about a year and a half ago, or well, probably more than that, uh, GSA started consolidating the various schedules into one master GSA schedule. So in the past, you had GSA Schedule 70 for IT services, you had Schedule 541, which was for advertising and integrated marketing services. You also had the GSA MOBIS schedule, which uh, was an acronym that stood for Mission Oriented uh, Business Information Services. Now there is just one GSA schedule, and then your differentiators underneath the schedule are special item numbers. So you had special item numbers in the past, and you continue to have them now. Uh, they just further identify what your product, service, or software is. And each of those SIN numbers will have different requirements to get on, particularly the IT uh, SIN numbers. Okay. Uh, but the theme here is that this is a solicitation, and so you want to make sure that, let's say you walk away today and say, oh, this is exactly what we want to do. This makes sense. The ROI is there. The return on investment is there. Let's move forward. And you start working on the proposal uh, that you're going to submit to GSA. Then you get busy because it's Q4, and then you pick this back up again in December. And so you're probably working uh, on a solicitation that has gone through some updates. So you want to make sure that you're cognizant of the fact that um, you're responding to the current solicitation and not one that was dated from July of 2021. Okay. And so as any good proposal uh, manager would have you do, you want to make sure that you map out a timeline. Uh, if there's some sort of software program that you use with this, um, that's obviously an independent choice within your company. Uh, but you want to map out a timeline, and we'll talk about timelines later. Compliance matrix to make sure that you do meet just the basics. Uh, you want to go through a quality control portion once everything is put together, and then you make the submission. So now we're going to talk about the proposal components, but let me just stop and see. It looks like there's a couple more uh, questions coming in. Uh, okay. I think we're all set there. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, the proposal component. So we've got three main sections, the administrative, the technical, and the pricing. Um, and so if you have questions on uh, whatever I'm covering in the administrative section, type those in and I'll answer those. Uh, and then like I said, we'll move to these other two sections. Um, so if your question is related to pricing, let's just save that for, uh, for that section. Um, but here we go through administrative. These are some things that, um, some components of the administrative section. You will need your last two years balance sheet and income statement. You want to be showing revenue. Um, there are some exceptions for some of these special item numbers that allow companies to substitute um, the owner's uh, resume and experience for um, some of the, the past performance and, and uh, skipping a year of being in business, I would not advise going down that path unless you have a robust pipeline, which is, in my opinion, highly unlikely. Um, so you want to make sure that you have a healthy balance sheet and income statement, preferably showing no losses and a decent amount of revenue. Um, typically, GSA will follow up, not always, but with a form called the uh, SF-527, that's the standard form 527. This will basically be asking your bank for a reference. Um, like I said, this is sometimes sent out after you submit your proposal, sent out from GSA to you. Um, but just take a look at that to make sure that uh, your bank is not going to have a, a problem completing that should you be 
uh, lucky enough to get that request. Uh, there are two, I'll call these, tests that GSA will have you complete. Uh, I'd almost encourage you doing this before you even decide to get onto the schedule. The first is the readiness assessment, and this can be found on the Vendor Support Center or VSC, again, vendorsupportcenter.gsa.gov. The readiness assessment is probably gonna take you anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour. Uh, to complete, they have you do some homework and some research on some of the GSA sites that will indicate how many uh, vendors within the special item number that you're looking at have zero sales. You, you might be astonished at the number that it's gonna be uh, probably anywhere from uh, 50 to 70% of the vendors. Uh, they'll have you look at um, who the top vendors within the in your special item number are. Uh, and it's usually the 80-20 rule here, meaning that the top 20% of the vendors are doing 80% of the work. Uh, they will tend to be large businesses, as you can imagine, and large businesses have that requirement to parse out a certain percent of their uh, business to small businesses. Uh, so like I said, the readiness assessment will be a little bit more research-based, um, and then there is, the bulk of it is really just uh, kind of clicking yes or no. Uh, the pathway to success also found on the Vendor Support Center. On the website I've got listed here, vsc.gsa.gov. Uh, this is another training. Give yourself anywhere from also 30 minutes to an hour to get through that. And I'd encourage you to go through both of these again, even before you decide or as part of the decision-making process. These two tests, um, will produce a certificate at the end that you'll need to sign and date. Uh, those are gonna have a heartbeat of a year. After one year, they will expire. So make sure that uh, when you submit this as part of your proposal package, uh, that those are not expired. Uh, you wanna make sure that your SAM record is current and that you have your correct NAICS code, uh, which is the North American Industry Classification System. It's a six digit number or code that identifies what it is you are selling. Uh, so for example, 541611, I believe, is the NAICS code for management consulting. And every SIN number, uh, special item number within the schedule will have a primary NAICS code that it is associated with. So again, make sure that in SAM, your SIN number matches your NAICS code. You should also provide your tax ID and your DUNS number. Uh, authorized negotiator, this is a, uh, well, the, the individual would be somebody typically outside of your company who is perhaps uh, like us, helping you put together the proposal and submit it to GSA, uh, working with GSA on your behalf to make sure that they don't push you around too much on pricing, uh, ensuring that you answer all of their questions that they come back with after they've done the proposal review. Um, if you are using outside counsel, outside consultant, whoever it is, uh, there is a form that will need to be submitted uh, indicating that you are authorizing this uh, individual or individuals to, um, to talk to GSA on your behalf. Uh, you also then within the actual proposal submission portal uh, will list people within your company that are designated authorized negotiators, meaning that they will have access to the proposal, to the contract, uh, and can perform some post-award uh, contract actions. It's easier to take care of this upfront than it is uh, after you're on the schedule. You also wanna note if your company has had any previous uh, GSA schedule holders or had a previous GSA schedule, if for example, you've had a schedule and then you got kicked off because you did not meet the $25,000 sales quota, uh, which is the quota that GSA will want you to bring in through your schedule. You'll need to indicate that. The, the letter from GSA that uh, is removing you from the schedule, the dates of your schedule, the schedule number and the special item numbers. Um, and uh, yeah, so just uh, note if you have uh, previously held a schedule uh, with GSA and provide all of that associated documentation. Okay, let's see, it looks like there's more questions or somebody raising a hand. Uh, bear with me a second, the font is very small in these um, questions. Okay, 
Uh, I think we're good here. So now we're going to move on. If nobody has questions about that administrative section, uh, I'll give you another second here to type in any questions that you have related to that. We'll move on to the technical and I'll take a quick sip of water. Okay, so technical section is, well, I think I may have this laid out later, but the timeline for the administrative, if you're doing this by yourself, kind of a do-it-yourself uh, GSA schedule at home, if you're you know, a small business, uh, I'd give yourself maybe a week or two um, or a weekend or two to get through that administrative section. Uh, once you've got that complete, uh, and again, be cognizant of the dates on that pathway to success as well as the readiness assessment. The technical section then is next. And this is going to include uh, four main components. The first is a corporate narrative. And this is uh, not just a free form that you tell GSA about your company, but they have six specific questions that you'll need to answer. Uh, and this is all found in the solicitation. So you'll answer those six questions. There is a um, character and word, uh, I'm sorry, a word uh, limit. So just use Microsoft Word or whatever um, service you use to make sure that you are not exceeding uh, that. But again, take the time to really answer these questions. It's you know one of the um, pieces where you do have an opportunity to tell GSA about your company uh, and why you would be a good we'll say fit for being on the schedule. Uh, it's gonna ask for a number of full-time employees, how long you've been in business, the type of work that you're doing, the corporate experience that you've had in the past. Uh, and then some information on the executives, your accounting uh, systems, um, that sort of uh, information. And usually ends up being no more than two pages. Um, but again, just uh, uh, make sure that you answer all six of their questions. Again, this is found in the solicitation. The second main component of the technical section is your quality control. And this is not just extracting your quality control uh, internal documentation. It's answering, again, I think it's roughly uh, six or seven questions on this one, also with a character and word limit. Um, you know, they're gonna ask who is in charge of your quality control program, the processes that you have in place when meeting urgent requirements, how you handle multiple contracts at the same time. So again, this is an opportunity to showcase your company, talk about uh, what you have that, um, that kind of makes your company a high quality company, that you're not going to miss any, uh, any pieces of, of being on the schedule. Um, you know, should you have multiple contracts coming in through the schedule at the same time. Uh, third piece here is a list of references. And if anyone has ever attempted to get onto the schedule in the past or perhaps held the schedule in the past, there was a company called Open Ratings. And what they would do is you would submit a list uh, of six references to Open Ratings uh, at a minimum. And Open Ratings would contact these uh, companies, your uh, customers and ask them um, to fill out a short survey. And that survey was asking about quality control, customer service, your pricing, responsiveness to any uh, issues that uh, that they had with you. Uh, open ratings uh, no longer exist. So the references, um, you have a minimum of three that you can provide and a maximum of five. Uh, they're gonna look for the company name, um, uh, the dates that you worked with them, the point of contact there, who would be able to act as a reference for you, uh, and then a short uh, description of the work that you did with that company. This is separate from the fourth component of the technical uh, section, which is the project narratives with your statement of work or the contract. Um, the project narratives, uh, this will typically be one project narrative per special item number that you're pursuing. If you're going after any of the IT SINs, be careful to read the solicitation. Most of those will require two project narratives. There is a timeline, uh, or I'm sorry, a, um, kind of a cutoff date that these contracts cannot, should not have expired more than three years ago, and they also need to have at least 12 months completed. So again, read the solicitation in case there have been any updates to, to what I'm telling you here. Uh, and to your specific special item number. If you're selling product, uh, you wanna make sure that 
you have a letter of supply if you are not the manufacturer. So if you're a dealer, reseller, distributor of, uh, let's say, um, uh, medical devices and you're trying to sell to HHS and the Veterans Administration hospitals uh, and the manufacturer, let's say, is in Canada, you want to make sure that that manufacturer has completed uh, what's called a letter of supply. Again, this can be found in the solicitation. Uh, and this is something I will say that you, you absolutely want to make sure that the supplier, the manufacturer, is willing to sign off on this document and not edit any verbiage, uh, because this could be a deal breaker. If, if you don't have a letter of supply, then GSA will not let you on the schedule. Again, this is for product companies only if you are not the manufacturer. Uh, you also want to make sure that you are compliant with the Trade Agreement Acts as well as Ability 1. Trade Agreement Acts will indicate where your product is manufactured. So if it's made in Argentina, China, um, North Korea, any of these countries that are on, uh, on the list, then uh, they will not be allowed to be on the schedule. I'll give you an example. Uh, years ago, I was selling, um, it was a, a video uh, service um, that was made in China, uh, and it can be sold to the federal government. It just cannot go on the GSA schedule. Um, and again, that's because it was made in China. Uh, ability one, these, uh, ability one, very similar uh, as far as format and process that you're going to need to monitor both the TAA and ability one because these are, I'll say, living, breathing um, regulations. So sometimes countries are added to or taken off the Trade Agreement Acts, and sometimes it varies from administration to administration, uh, but you should have a monitoring system in place, uh, perhaps on a monthly basis to uh, to make sure that you know that, let's say you're uh, the company that is the manufacturer, maybe they move their headquarters from Canada to China. Um, you need to make sure that you're going to be aware of that because if that happens, then you're going to have to remove those products from your schedule. Or if, let's this is a very extreme example, let's say uh, your products are made in Canada, but then Canada suddenly becomes uh, an enemy of the US, then uh, they may be moved uh, to this list. So again, just make sure that you have some uh, process in place to monitor that. Uh, the last one, as I mentioned here, I keep uh, going back and forth between these two. Sorry about that, uh, is Ability One. Ability One is part of Unicor, uh, which falls under Department of Justice. So that's the prison systems. And uh, these guys are sometimes in manufacturing facilities where they are making anything from, let's say, uh, police uniforms to um, license plates. So whatever products uh, the Ability One group is making or manufacturing, you cannot have on your GSA schedule. So again, very similar to TAA, you're going to make sure that you have to have that you have a system in place in order to uh, monitor what is uh, on both of those lists. And those, like I said, are dynamic list uh, living, breathing entities that will um, go through changes throughout uh, throughout the year. And a couple more questions coming in. Um, okay, I'll take this one here, which is what happens if you don't hit the $25,000 uh, GSA quota? So um, kind of going back to some of the requirements, uh, the $25,000 through your schedule needs, that quota is actually for the first two years and then every year thereafter. So, um, so if you don't hit it the first year, the first year is basically a grace period, and then you've got the next 12 months to hit that um, hit that number. If you don't, GSA will then send a warning letter to you asking to um, see what sort of activities you've had in place. Um, and so you want basically to show them the RFPs and RFQs that you responded to um, through your schedule, what you've got in your pipeline, you know, who you're talking to as far as your customers that or prospects that have told you, yes, we're going to buy uh, specifically from you and specifically through the schedule. Uh, again, if if you've done your homework um, up front and you're not waiting to market your schedule and services until you've got the, the schedule, then you really shouldn't experience this problem. Um, you don't want to get a GSA schedule and then say, oh, okay, now let's uh, hire a BD, a business development or a marketing person. Again, that should happen up front to really determine 
So kind of reverse engineer, I guess we could say, who's your customer? How do they prefer to purchase? Okay, uh, yes, you're not immediately dropped. You do then have an opportunity to respond to DSA and show them what's in your pipeline, what you've responded to. Uh, and at that point, they can either decide to continue and maintain your schedule, which maybe they'll give you another six months or a year uh, or not. Okay, and we'll go back here to the technical. Uh, if you're selling services, uh, you wanna make sure that your human resources plan is submitted, specifically the pieces for how you compensate uh, overtime, how you pay overtime and uh, how and when your employees are compensated. Uh, another piece here is if you are selling IT services, you wanna make sure that you are compliant with section 508. Again, all of this is in the solicitation. These are just highlights that I'm pulling out. Uh, that technical section, I add um, a week or two, a weekend or two if you're doing it yourself on the weekends or a week or two if you're doing it in the, the evenings as a, uh, as a small business without any help. Now we're probably at about you know, a month to get through that administrative and technical section. It can certainly be done in a shorter time frame, but just as an FYI. Okay, now we'll talk about the last section, which is the pricing. And this is where we're gonna spend, uh, I'll say the bulk of our time. So uh, as part of kind of the, the pros or the advantages of being on the schedule, when the government is purchasing from you, and this is again, any federal government agency, they know that you've been vetted because you've uh, submitted past performance documentation, copies of contracts, you've provided the, the references uh, to GSA. Um, you're also going to submit information on your pricing and your, uh, you'll open the kimono and share a lot of information about uh, your customers that receive the lowest prices, uh, the names of those customers, or the categories of customers. Uh, and then your that again shows that you do have this past performance and that your, your pricing is competitive, uh, particularly with the other vendors on the schedule because GSA will know that, um, or GSA will negotiate with you based on those uh, other prices. And that was the site that we looked at, the calc.gsa.gov. So uh, in the pricing section, uh, again, this is, um, we'll kind of first talk about the, anyone selling professional services, job titles, labor categories. So you'll have a labor category matrix, which will provide the uh, special item number, the job title or the labor category that you're proposing to GSA, the minimum years of experience, and then the minimum education. And those are all the parameters that you could look at on the Calc site. So this is just a very simple Excel spreadsheet. Uh, you will then need uh, to either have a commercial price list that takes all of that, uh, that information on the job titles and the labor categories and put your associated commercial uh, pricing with it. You'll, I'm just kind of gonna go down these th bullets. I'm now on uh, bullet three. And I'll go back to explain some of the other uh, pieces, but just at a high level, your backup documentation, you're gonna need an invoice for each and every line item that you are proposing. So if you have a project manager level one and a project manager level two, you will need an invoice for the project manager level one. Let's say that's at $100 per hour, uh, as well as your project manager level two, let's say that's $120 per hour. Um, and then this will get formatted and put into the GSA price proposal, which again is found in the GSA solicitation. There's gonna be multiple columns here. You're gonna have the labor, the SIN number, the labor category, um, some keywords, your commercial pricing, who you've given your lowest price to, which is called your most favorite customer, and then the rates that you're going to offer to GSA, which uh, will basically be the lowest prices on that spreadsheet. Uh, as a best practice, you probably, uh, as I mentioned many, many times, and probably will continue to mention throughout the presentation, is conduct that competitive analysis, which again is going to the Calc site if you're selling professional services to say, okay, uh, our project manager level one, let's say is $100. Uh, we gave a rate to ABC company of $98. And so GSA, we're gonna propose to you a rate of uh, $95. So then you'll, you'll go over to the Calc site and come up with at least three competitors for each uh, labor category or job title. 
that indicate a rate that's higher than what you're proposing that are again comparing apples to apples so if your um, job title has a minimum five years of experience uh, and a bachelor's degree then uh, make sure that you're comparing that to your labor category uh, additionally you'll need what's called the csp or commercial sales practice which will uh, do a couple things this is probably one of the most important documents in your proposal which really is just based on your pricing, the discounts that you're giving to your most favorite customer, as well as the discounts that you're gonna to propose to GSA. You'll indicate the category uh, of customers that you give your lowest prices to. So let's say anytime you deal with nonprofits or associations, you always give them a 10% discount. You'll reflect that on this CSP document. Uh, and then the other piece of this is um, showing your annual sales. Uh, which should match exactly the number that's in the balance sheet and income statement that you're submitting, uh, and then your projected sales for each of the SIN numbers that you're pursuing through the schedule. Uh, they're not going to hold your feet to the fire for the projected sales, but it should be something that's realistic, and it should hopefully be something that's more than uh, $25,000 per year. Uh, if that's all you think you can do, then the schedule is probably not um, in your best interest, and you should have a a specific number again this should be, really be uh, being pulled from your pipeline uh, we see these opportunities we know the dollar value of this upcoming gsa contract is x uh, we think we can compete for it like these should again be very specific numbers you also want to include here a fair and reasonable statement um, meaning that you believe that your pricing proposed pricing to gsa is fair and reasonable and basically your explanation would be based on the competitive analysis that you're pulling from the calc site uh, let me just stop here to answer any questions okay okay another question about the rate comparison that is on the calc.gsa.gov site you'll type in your labor category uh, in the main search field. And then on the right-hand side, you'll have the drop-down buttons, which allow you to uh, be more specific. And this is really, uh, you'll need to complete those. So if, you're, if your job title is project manager with five years of experience and, um, and bachelor's, then you'll type in project manager, five years of experience, bachelor's, and let's say you're providing IT services make sure you're comparing yourself to other companies that are on that schedule that also uh, have those requirements for that job title. Okay. And I'm gonna move on here. Uh, for products, actually, let me go back here. For the product companies, I'm not sure if there are any product uh, companies on the line today, uh, but you would do the same um, analysis on the GSA Advantage site. Your spreadsheets will look similar, but not exactly the same as the professional services. Uh, you'll have the SKU numbers, um, the unit price, uh, again, your most favored customer uh, pricing, which is really your lowest price, and then uh, the rates that you're going to propose to GSA. Again, you'll need an invoice for each and every line item that you're uh, proposing to GSA. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit more here about this, uh, the CSP, and then I'll show you some screenshots of it. Again, this is the most important document in the, uh, in the proposal. Uh, and this is where you open the kimono and share with GSA what your pricing policies are. And you basically have standard discounts as well as non-standard discounts. Your standard discounts are going to be uh, anything that's, say, a standard within your company, something that you do on a normal basis, meaning you always give a 10% discount to associations and nonprofits. Non-standard would be, we started our business five years ago and that first year uh, we gave a 50%, you know, something astronomical um, discount to all of our customers just to start generating revenue. Um, so GSA, uh, and the reason this is important is because GSA will want uh, the GSA, your GSA rate to be comparable to your standard discount, something that you normally do on a regular basis. Um, you, you still wanna disclose what your non-standard discounts are, but um, you'll justify it by saying, hey, the reason we gave 
somebody rate of $50 per hour versus $100 per hour. It was a non-standard discount. It was a, a one-time discount. It's not part of our regular business practice. Um, so if you do have any uh, extreme, extremely discounted customers, if you can explain why in a uh, strong and creative narrative that it's not part of what you normally do, uh, then GSA won't hold your feet to the fire on that. So again, just a better visual here on the left, you've got the standard discounts. Again, part of what you, you do day to day, all of the sales reps know that, yes, we're dealing with an association, so we're gonna discount their prices by 10% for nonprofits, whatever it is. Uh, your non-standard discounts are the one-time discounts that you gave just to win the business. Um, they don't also make up a large portion of your revenue. Um, if they do, then that, uh, that strategy is not going to work for you. Um, and so you, in order to show this, you'll have to have other, other invoices showing um, that you have typically charged higher rates, not the 50% the discount. Again, GSA will want uh, rates that are comparable or lower than your standard discounts. Um, again, if you're giving any discounts that are very extreme, you can justify that to GSA by saying they were really non-standard. Again, it was a one-time spot discount. Uh, and this just reiterates what I said. It looks like we've got a question. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, justification and, and invoices in a second, um, because as I mentioned, you will need, uh, the last question was about uh, showing invoices and justification. So let me just cover that now real quick. And I apologize, these classes are usually uh, more effective in person with a whiteboard. Um, but for example, if your invoices just show a lump sum, uh, meaning you know, you're billing, let's just say $200,000 every month to ABC company, and the invoice says uh, IT professional services consulting, uh, $200,000, you know, ABC company, June 1st, uh, 2021. Then your July 1st, 2021 says the same exact thing. What you would do then is put, uh, provide that invoice plus an Excel spreadsheet behind that says, okay, the, the people that worked on this or the job titles that worked on this were, um, so one column is going to have your labor categories. Maybe you had a systems engineer level one, maybe you had a project manager, maybe you had a program manager, maybe you had a Microsoft certified uh, systems engineer, uh, maybe you had a, a Cisco person as well. Um, so you would list all of those labor categories. You would then list next to that their associated hourly rate. Uh, next to that column, you would list the number of hours that they worked that month and then come up with the totals. Total that and that number should match exactly the front of the invoice. So the $200,000 per month. If your invoices look like uh, Joe Smith, uh, $100 per hour, worked you know 50 hours this month, that total is X and then you've got people's names listed on that invoice, uh, you would basically do a crosswalk. So Joe Smith is a program manager, uh, Susie Brown is a systems engineer. Uh, so that's how you would come up with your invoice justification if your invoices are not detailed with the labor category, the hourly rate, uh, and the number of hours worked. So hopefully that answers uh, the question for that uh, individual that typed uh, that in. I'll just go back here, double check. Okay. Uh, let me just keep moving here. So pricing, uh, GSA conducts two litmus tests, and this is really just kind of a review of uh, what we uh, talked about. The first is your internal pricing discounts, and that is the, uh, they will want something that's comparable to your standard discounts. And then the second is the uh, ensuring that your uh, rates that you're proposing to them are in sync with the other schedule holders. If the, your rates are higher than the other schedule holders that you're proposing, there's really no reason, like why should GSA let you on the schedule if, uh, if you're overpriced? Again, you can find that information on the calc.gsa.gov site or gsaadvantage.gov if you're selling products. So as I mentioned here, again, do this homework in advance. The worst thing to do is get through a lot of the sections of the proposal only to find that your 
this is not going to be a good fit for you because your prices are too high and you'll go out of business if, uh, if you have to lower your rates. Okay. And for anyone that's joining us late, the slides and the recording will uh, all be sent out. Now, once you're, uh, you've negotiated with GSA, you've got your award, post-award, again, keep in mind, I'm repeating myself here a little bit, uh, just because there's a lot of information and a lot of moving parts, your GSA rates are a price ceiling, uh, or again, a not to exceed rate. So as you start bidding for work through your schedule, you're going to give lower rates than your GSA rate. And if you're dealing with, even if it's with the federal government, uh, let's say, uh, like it mentioned earlier, Department of Commerce comes to you and they want to purchase you know, $100,000 worth of your product, service, or software, and they decide not to purchase through the schedule, um, you cannot go below your GSA rates, or if it's McDonald's or whoever, but keep in mind, it, it can still be a government entity or agency or department, federal, state, local, doesn't matter. Uh, if you go below your GSA rates, you're then the uh, bells and whistles coming out of your accounting system, and you'll have to notify GSA that you deviated and went lower than your GSA rates. So GSA should always, 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 always be your lowest price customer. Okay, and here's just an example. Uh, let's say you submitted your proposal to GSA, you've got your award, your GSA rate is $100 per hour for your project manager with five years of experience and a bachelor's degree. So if somebody's purchasing through the schedule, let's say in order to, you know that it's gonna be a competitive bid that you know all the schedule holders are probably going after this, or I don't know, at least 20% of them are. Uh, so you decide to go a little bit lower, which is smart uh, and again, encouraged. So through your schedule, let's say you uh, come in uh, on your bid at $95 per hour, uh, but outside of your schedule, you're not going to be able to go lower. Uh, you can do your GSA rate or higher. Okay, any questions on pricing? Like I said, there are a lot of uh, moving parts. Um, and I will just also mention, your schedule is initially a five-year contract with three five-year renewable periods. So in essence, it's a 20-year contract if you exercise all of the renewal periods. Uh, at the end of the first 12 months, you do, depending upon how you structure your pricing, uh, if it's based on a commercial price list, you then will have the option to go in and update your pricing and hopefully increase it. If your pricing is based on market rates, uh, then you will have an indicator, sometimes and typically based on Department of Labor Table 5 uh, indicator, an average of, uh, of what you see on the Department of Labor Table 5 uh, index. So that number is probably going to be anywhere from 1% to 3%, depending upon what's happening in the economy. And you can build out uh, your rates for that full 20 years. So as you're sleuthing around doing homework, you may see some companies that have their GSA rates built out for 20 years on their schedule. Uh, that simply means that they use uh, market rates um, for their pricing. If you see a company that only has their one year of rates listed on their schedule, it means that they've used a commercial price list. Uh, there are pros and cons to both. And uh, I've just decided after doing so many of these webinars that if we, that can be kind of going down a rabbit hole. Um, so it's a separate webinar based on, uh, on pricing. Uh, and we do have some, um, some of those on our site as well. So let's talk about the, uh, the timeline. Um, I think we're coming up here on, okay, on 30. Um, so an hour in. So the proposal prep, as I mentioned, about one to two weeks. And this is kind of, if you're, like I said, doing it yourself. Uh, that technical section, also about one to two weeks, and you may get both of these done in uh, three days. That's great. Um, but this is just kind of built around averages based on small businesses where the CEO is trying to do this and also run the business uh, on a day-to-day -day basis and perhaps has a family uh, and maybe a hobby or not. Um, the pricing section, about two to three weeks, because that could be a little bit more um, cumbersome, especially with pulling uh, invoices to show that you have sold these, uh, you've sold these product services or software in the past. 
um, and that pricing analysis to make sure that what you're proposing to GSA, that you're not giving away too much, uh, that you save some for the price negotiations with GSA, uh, but just also that you're you're competitive. And if you have a labor category that um, that you have a really high rate for, that you sell a lot of, you do not need to put that on your schedule. I mean, you have a choice of which of your labor categories you want to include and which you do not. Uh, you probably then want some outside eyeballs uh, or even somebody internally that wasn't part of the process that is uh, pretty good at, um, that's, we'll say, pays attention to details, uh, who can do a quality control review for you and has understand the, uh, and can basically look at the proposal compliance matrix uh, and make any corrections. One to two weeks, again, this could be done in, uh, a couple hours could be done in three days or it could take longer, um, but I'd probably um, suggest about one to two weeks. So in essence, we're looking here at, uh, at one to two months uh, to basically just get this proposal put together. Got another question. Here. Between capture and proposal prep, how many months on average have you seen this process take? Um, so that, that capture process, and I'd also put just that due diligence, the homework on looking at, you know, to make sure that your pricing is competitive. Um, I would say uh, six months because, uh, six to nine months because that uh, that capture process, and it also depends, you know, there's really no cookie cutter answer. If you're an established firm that already has some government contracts and you, you know, just, you know, your customers that you're talking to have started to say, hey, you know, this contract's coming up for, Recompete next year, we're thinking about moving it to GSA. Well, yeah, that's a green light. Um, start kind of moving in that direction. Put your blinker on it and start getting in the GSA lane. Um, if you've got you know, three or four of those customers that have indicated that to you, then yeah, definitely uh, pedal to the metal there and move towards GSA. Um, but a company that you know is maybe two or three people and two of the three are working full time, uh, that capture process may take a little bit longer. Uh, because you're not out there uh, networking, building relationships, even though most of it these days is still somewhat online. Um, it really just kind of depends on, on I will say, the um, where you are in the life cycle of your business. Are you a seasoned business? Do you have full-time sales reps uh, that are dedicated just towards the federal government? Or are you a company that is only really sold to other commercial companies? Uh, did you start up yesterday or, or just two years ago? Um, so I'm sorry not to give an exact answer there, but uh, roughly I'm going to say, you know, six to nine months. You certainly do not. The biggest takeaway today should be that you do not want to wait until you have the schedule to start marketing it and start doing the BD. It's There's so much free data out there that um, you'd be foolish not to have the pipeline in place first. Everything moves slow within government. Um, that by the time you got the schedule, you're probably still going to be, you know, talking to some of these people and, and trying to migrate them towards your schedule just to limit that competition. Um, and you don't want to be reactive with the schedule. You want to be proactive. So, uh, and again, there's so much free data out there that um, you can do this. Okay. And I'm going to move to the next slide here. So GSA, um, the, the portal to submit your proposal is the GSA e-offer website, and uh, you actually do not need a digital certificate. Um, there's more of um, a token authentic authentication process that you go through, so I need to update that slide. I apologize. Um, and because this is pretty much, uh, I'll say 70% of it is a cut and paste job. Uh, so for example, if we think back to the um, to the technical section that has the corporate narrative and the quality control. Each of those, like I mentioned, has about uh, six questions that you'll need to answer. So you'll need to cut and paste uh, the answers for each of those questions in the eOffer um, portal. And so not that that takes a lot of time, but um, in addition to that, you probably then also want to save that full document as a PDF and upload that separately, just in case something uh, gets a little screwy within the uh, in the technology, which obviously we know can happen. So give yourself a day, especially if it's one person that is uploading this. Again, you probably want somebody with 
uh, fresh eyes to maybe look at it after that person has uh, input all of the data just to make sure that everything uh, matches um, all of the numbers, the invoices, the labor categories, that everything is uniform. Uh, if you change a labor category on your commercial price list and you're going to have to change it in the price proposal template, you're going to have to change it in the labor categories template. Um, so a change in one spot is going to affect changes in, in many other documents. That's why I say a day uh, and maybe a, a big pot of coffee as well. Um, and so if the, the same person that is uh, submitting the uh, proposal through the portal uh, is going to also just then step back and re-review it, I'd say a week, if you have some outside eyeballs, um, then you can probably just um, get that done like the next day or so. Uh, and then if there are any corrections that need to be made, that's why I kind of threw in there about a week. Uh, if you're doing this again on evenings and weekends, uh, it may take a, a full weekend and then maybe the following weekend just to go back and um, do the review and make any edits. Uh, as I mentioned, once you then submit the proposal to GSA, it sits in their queue uh, for a little while and you may, I've um, been seeing this maybe about 50% of the time lately, uh, receive the standard form 527. Uh, this is a financial request, and it's basically a bank reference form. You can Google for the form, uh, make sure that uh, you can complete all of it. Uh, your bank, uh, as I mentioned, will also have to, um, to complete the reference uh, portion of it. So uh, if you do have a good relationship with your bank, you maybe want to make sure that they have this in advance. That way you can do uh, provide a quick turnaround to GSA if and when the time comes. Um, again, this is not required as part of your initial request. This happens after you've submitted your proposal to GSA and just something you should be ready for should they uh, come to you with this. So now you've submitted your proposal to GSA and you're waiting, waiting, waiting. Uh, you'll typically get a, a welcome letter that says, you know, Joe Smith is going to be reviewing your proposal. Um, and then I'll say anywhere from a month to, it just really depends, uh, three, four, five, six months later, sometimes I've seen it take almost a year, um, you'll get uh, an email from GSA, and this will go to all of the authorized negotiators. So anyone that you've listed on your proposal who is authorized to interact with GSA uh, will then be included in this email. And it's usually just a round of, of questions. Sometimes they have, you know, one or two things they want to maybe see an additional invoice or maybe the labor category that you changed on one document doesn't match another or the competitive analysis that you provide uh, is now outdated or was not submitted. Um, this is um, basically means that you have passed muster. Um, so this is good. Uh, you have not been rejected. Um, but GSA just wants some clarifications. The way that this happens is they send you an email. Let's say the email comes on a Tuesday, uh, depending upon um, how lengthy or not their questions are. Uh, they could say that it's due on Thursday at three o'clock Eastern, or they could tell you it's due on Monday at five o'clock Eastern. So sometimes there could be a very quick turnaround. So this is why you uh, probably want more than one person to be on uh, to be listed as an authorized negotiator because if somebody misses this email and you miss the deadline uh, not something that's encouraged and whatever deadline they give you like i said sometimes it's you know 48 hours later um, you just want to uh, err on the side of a giving them complete uh, documentation on your reply but then also doing it in advance if you can so if you can get it done in 24 hours without being sloppy, uh, then I would encourage that. And that'll, that will motivate them as well, uh, meaning that will motivate GSA to work with you. They see that you are you know, excited to get the schedule, that you're replying fast, and, and they will then uh, try to do the same. This is just based on, on my experience. Um, once you do respond though, sometimes it's you know two days, sometimes it's two weeks, sometimes it's two months later. Um, lately, it's uh, been more on the shorter side, which is encouraging and, and good news for both GSA, but then uh, more importantly for you guys, it shortens the, uh, the timelines. That they may either come back with additional questions or then what would happen 
uh, is that they would move to what's called the price negotiation. And that looks like we've got a, another question here. Yes, today's session is recorded. Uh, if we're talking about the GSA clarifications, that's typically the format is email. Um, and then once you have answered their questions, like I said, they will move to the negotiations. And this is where they will take every single line item. So if you're proposing 175 products, uh, they will ask for typically additional discounts um, on these 175 line items. And it may be uh, uniform discounts. We want an additional 3% off of all of your products. Or they may say for product or line number one, we want seven, an additional 7% discount. Line number two, we want 3%. Line number three, we want 20%, whatever it is. Um, so it can be uniform, it could be uh, a couple line items, it could be all of your line items. So this is why sometimes it's useful to have outside help um, to make sure that you don't give away everything up front, that you leave something here on the table for negotiations. Uh, if they do not come back with uh, any request here for negotiations, then you probably gave away too much, which means that you probably didn't do your homework um, too well on that calc site or GSA advantage. The counter offer, like I said, usually comes uh, in the form of email, and this can usually it's just one round. Um, you know, if they ask for 3% and you come back with, hey, can we're going to offer you 2%, uh, don't feel like you need to give in to their request here. Uh, they're also going to ask for prompt payment discounts and quantity and or volume discounts. Uh, I highly suggest not offering any of those with your initial proposal uh, and wait here for the negotiations to see what they want on each of your line items. Uh, and this, the negotiations, I'm going to say uh, probably closer to one to two weeks and uh, it could extend to a month, but typically not. Um, so don't be, don't be shy about countering um, and even countering their counter. It looks like we've got another question. Uh, yes, today's session is being recorded and I believe Elizabeth will send that out. I will send it to her and she will send it out. The slides will also be provided. Okay. Uh, once you have worked through the negotiations, and actually one thing I wanted to mention, um, if GSA is asking, let me just go back to the slide, let's say your, uh, each of your line items, an additional, just for example, we'll say 2%, uh, and, and you think that additional 2% would, I don't know, put you out of business, uh, you can could then potentially counter with, hey, we'll give you an additional 1%, and in addition to that, we'll throw in uh, prompt payment discounts uh, and or some sort of volume or quantity discount. So your prompt payment discount could be something like 0.25% on terms of, let's say, net 15, meaning the government pays you in uh, 15 days or less, and so you need to throw in an additional 0.25%. Should you agree to that, all of your future invoices will need to, and your quotes uh, through your schedule will need to indicate that is part of your terms and conditions. It's also going to need to be reflected in your price list. Uh, the volume discounts, sometimes they will come um, right out and ask for maybe, it's usually something uh, astronomical, like uh, 2% on orders of, I don't know, $350,000, um, which is kind of extreme. So you can uh, say, hey, you know, this is not something that we're willing to do, but in 12 months we can revisit this and perhaps throw in a discount. So once you've uh, agreed to agree and everything is settled on the pricing, that's really the last uh, piece of, of kind of that back and forth um, where there are really any chances to make any changes. You'll then move to what's, uh, you'll receive a letter called the FPR, the Final Proposal Revision Letter. And this will just recap everything that you agreed to, the terms, conditions, the discounts, the prompt payment, the uh, quantity slash volume discounting, uh, the coverage of the area, are you selling U.S. only, CONUS, OCONUS, um, and that usually comes a day or a week after the pricing has been settled. What you'll do then is sign that letter, send it back to GSA, and then you'll eventually be um, directed to go back into the GSA e-offer 
website, sign the contract, and then you've got your award. So at that point, uh, you can celebrate. I'd say you probably only want to celebrate for about um, five to ten minutes. Uh, and because the clock is ticking then, you've got the two years to hit that $25,000 through your schedule. Um, and then again, everything outside of that doesn't count. GSA wants that 25K through your schedule. So at this point, you're gonna go back to your pipeline and say, hey, Joe Smith at the Air Force, or hey, Susie Brown at Department of Commerce, we've got our schedule now and I know that we've been talking and you wanted to buy our product services or software through the schedule. Here's our schedule number. Um, so that's kind of how it typically should work. You should, again, kind of reverse engineer into this process. Um, but post award, there are going to be some requirements. First is registering in what's called SIP, uh, which stands for the Schedule Input Program. It's where you upload your price list, your terms and conditions. Uh, and these will be the price list that you see on the GSA Advantage website. Uh, you'll then register once your SIP file is accepted. It'll show then on GSA Advantage. You're going to then be required to go to GSA eBuy and register there to get your uh, RFP notifications that are just for your specific special item number. Uh, and then the third piece here for post-award compliance is uh, submitting your GSA sales reporting. And depending upon how you're set up, you're either providing uh, monthly or quarterly payments to GSA, which are uh, what's called the industrial funding fee, the IFF. Uh, this is 0.75% of your GSA schedule sales. Um, it's actually built into your GSA pricing. The customer pays for it, meaning let's say the Air Force is buying your services through the schedule. Um, they will uh, pay that fee. You then have to then turn around and pay it to GSA. So it's really just an administrative function. It's the cost of doing business with GSA. And this is kind of why the other contract vehicles have, um, have popped up. Uh, a question here says the labor category rates, is that the ceiling? Your GSA rates are a price ceiling or a not to exceed rate. Um, and so again, through the schedule, you're encouraged to give lower rates outside of your schedule. Uh, you cannot. Okay. Uh, so again, that sales reporting uh, portal, um, depending upon, like I said, how your schedule is set up, it's either monthly or quarterly payments to GSA. If your GSA schedule sales are zero, you're still gonna need to go in and report zero in order to be compliant. If you've done a million dollars with the Air Force, but not through the schedule, then uh, it's still zero. Uh, if that is the Air Force through your schedule, then yes, you would need to uh, to pay 0.75% of that dollar amount. So from best practices, uh, you want to make sure that once you've got that award, that you've got your GSA logo on your website, and uh, this it's allowed, it's encouraged, and you want that to then link to your GSA Advantage price list. Um, for anyone that uses an auto signature in their email, which I highly encourage, you probably want to have the GSA logo there that also links to your GSA Advantage price list. Uh, your capability statement, any other marketing collateral that you use, the back of your business card, um, basically anything. You really want to flaunt it because uh, you've done so much work to get there. Um, uh, you do want to try to run your business through the schedule as, as best as possible. Uh, if you do a press release, um, getting the schedule, I'm, I'm not going to say it's as great as having a library card, um, but uh, I'd maybe wait until perhaps you have a sale or two under your belt through your schedule. If you want to flaunt that, then maybe the press release is appropriate, but just getting the schedule, I mean, uh, there's 20,000 companies on the schedule, and you know, if you still have zero, through your um, the sales through the schedule, it's it's not something to uh, to you know create a press release for, uh, unless it's going just to your uh, specific prospects that purchase through the schedule. Like, hey, we do have the schedule now, um, just to let them know that uh, you're up and running. You would give them your schedule number, the link to your prices, uh, make sure that everything then is up on your your website. Um, and everything else that I have listed here. 
uh, also just as part of, you know, just a good uh, capture process is just continuing touching your pipeline and, and letting these folks know that, yes, you are on the schedule and, you know, here's how they can get to you. It's a, a bridge or a contract vehicle in order for them to uh, reduce some paperwork and reduce the um, uh, competition piece within procurement. So instead of them going out to find three vendors and doing pricing analysis, all of that has been done upfront uh, through your schedule, through getting uh, onto this contract vehicle. You wanna also make sure that you've got that back office compliance, and this is the reporting of the industrial funding fee. Um, if you're a large business, you'll then have a subcontracting plan, so making sure that that is in place. Um, you're also going to start receiving uh, GSA initiated modifications. So as GSA makes updates to the solicitation, I'm just gonna use an extreme example here. Let's say now as part of the proposal process, they're going to require that you um, uh, submit your mother's maiden name and your blood type. Um, so if that is required for the new vendors, then uh, you'll receive this modification and you'll have to go in and accept that, yes, you re also agree to these terms and conditions. Uh, the other modifications are the modifications that your company will initiate. So if your address changes, if your business size goes from large to small or small to large, if uh, you're part of a merger or acquisition, if, uh, if you want to change your pricing, you'll again have to wait for 12 months. If you've submitted with a commercial price list, um, if uh, I'm trying to think other modifications. So things along those lines, if you want to add a new special item number, if you want to add a new labor category, if you want to delete a labor category um, or a product or, or software component, and uh, these would all be vendor initiated modifications. These will all flow through the GSA uh, eMod um, and eOffer portal. Uh, and yeah, the best, most uh, important part of the uh, the best practice again is really just this upfront homework. Uh, I really hate for anybody to start getting through the administrative, the technical, and the pricing section, only to find that their rates are 30% higher than everybody else on the GSA schedule. And once you get to negotiations with GSA, they're going to try to uh, bump you down 30% because they're going to say, hey, we've got you know 10,000 other vendors here. That's extreme. Let's say a thousand other vendors. Uh, that provide these same services at a rate that's much lower than you. There's really no reason uh, to have you on at these higher rates. Unless, of course, there is something in your job description that requires, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, that they have, I don't know, it would be an advanced degree or some sort of certification, or maybe you have different rates and you should have different rates for uh, folks that have clearances versus those that do not. Um, so just keep uh, this in mind that, again, this sector is so unique uh, that there is no other sector out there that you can go around and dig and find this much information in order to make decisions about what agencies you should be selling to, uh, opportunities that are coming up for bid, um, SBA scorecard information, GSA schedule information, pricing information down to the hourly rates that that companies have listed. I mean, that is, that's golden. Um, so use that to your advantage and, and really spend this time up front before you you have a schedule and end up like some of these companies that have the build it and they will come uh, idea, which uh, really doesn't serve any purpose and you've wasted time, money and effort where maybe a different contract vehicle uh, could have been more helpful to you uh, versus kind of uh, going down this very narrow path, which if we go back to that pie chart, uh, where again, GSA comes in at about 10 to 15 percent of overall purchases. You're going down a very narrow path uh, without really seeing the whole picture. So that takes us to, where are we? Yeah, two o'clock. So we've got 30 minutes left for uh, Q&A, and I apologize if I went too fast uh, through any portion here, but happy to answer questions. And Usually in person, this takes a little bit longer simply because um, we've got a whiteboard and we can uh, draw some things out. But let me pull up these uh, questions again. Start with me. Okay, questions. And I'll read us. 
Okay, and I'm going to go through all the questions just in case uh, anybody missed anything and even if some of these are, are repeats. So uh, what happens if you get on GSA for the first time and don't sell 25k um, in your first year? Are you immediately dropped? Uh, no, you are not. The 25k is quota is per year and through your schedule. Um, so GSA will send a warning letter and basically what you want to reply with there is uh, showing them all of the responses that you've sent to the various RFPs, show them what's in your pipeline, um, and ask for an extension. Okay. And I think you mentioned this earlier, but to confirm the GSA threshold rates apply only to the labor categories we list on the schedule. In other words, we can do a project manager two not listed on the schedule and that labor category will not have restrictions on the rate so correct if uh you don't have to put all of your uh whatever you sell commercially you do are not required to put on the schedule you can pick and choose so if you only want to put three labor categories out of the hundred that you sell uh that's fine okay and next question is the labor category rate is that the ceiling or lowest rate you can offer the government. No, you're they're a ceiling and you can go below the ceiling. So whatever your GSA rates are, you're gonna be encouraged to give lower rates than that through your schedule. Okay, the recording link, as we mentioned, will be sent out as, as well the slides. Okay, bear with me. Okay. Somebody asked for slides associated with the Simplified Acquisition uh, webinar. Yes, those are on our website under webinars, and then just scroll down to Simplified Acquisitions. I believe uh, the Virginia PTAC probably also has a uh, class on this if you don't find uh, our information sufficient. Uh, next question is between capture and proposal prep, how many months on average? Have you seen this process take? And like you said, it's you know could be anywhere from you know six months to uh, much longer than that. Uh, really, just depends on um, on your company. Are you new to government contracting? Have you been in business for 30 years and it's you know something your company is now thinking about? Um, uh, or you know, or have you been selling to the government and uh, you've got some feelers out there? Uh, next question is, how do we account for TNM versus fixed price contracts? Uh, so like I mentioned, there are a couple of examples uh, as far as basically putting an Excel spreadsheet behind your invoice to indicate what labor categories were used, as well as the amount of time and hourly rate uh, for each of those labor categories to make those um, the invoice number match with the, the backup. Uh, could you show again how to perform rate comparison search? Your rate comparisons can be found on gsaadvantage.gov, and that's where you're going to find more of the um, product and uh, software pricing. And if you're selling professional services, meaning labor categories, that's going to be on the calc, calc.gsa.gov. Okay, if you win a schedule, what do you have to do to renew your application? Uh, is it the entire process over again every year? So the schedule is a five-year contract initially, and then uh, three five-year renewable periods after that. So start to finish, it's a 20-year contract. In order to get renewed, you need to meet that 25K sales quota. You need to be compliant, so reporting all of the uh, industrial funding fee, accepting all the mass mods, making sure your price list is up, uh, all of these sort of activities. Um, and then the renewal, uh, you're basically submitting a uh, price proposal template, and then depending upon how you're set up, either your CSP, that commercial sales practices, or not. Okay. Uh, what happens if you get on GSA and don't sell 25K? I think I already answered that one a couple times. Um, and, 
what's the URL for the site to look at GSA prices? Again, gsaadvantage.gov for products and um, calc.gsa.gov for uh, for the uh, professional services. If best in class GWAX government wide acquisition contracts are hard to get on, large partners can lock small businesses out, and most GSA e buy opportunities are wired for incumbents, then there's little hope for true small business. What are your thoughts for true small business new entrants? Uh, of course, develop relationships and subcontract. Uh, exactly. I mean, this is. Um, probably one of the most competitive markets out there. Um, I think a lot of it is really just doing, being very focused on what it is that you do and, and what do you do well, uh, be known for that one thing. Um, so if it's architecture and engineering, be known for that. If it's landscaping, if it's you know IT services and or data migration or whatever it is, be known for that. And then start conducting some research either through these websites or any of the data aggregators that are out there uh, where you can uh, sift through the data to come up with some opportunities that you should bid on. Um, perhaps consider partnering with other small businesses either to uh, increase your footprint or to eliminate them as competitors. Um, you can form a mentor protege uh, agreements, uh, teaming, partnering, subcontracting, there's joint ventures, there's so many different ways to skin the cat. A lot of it is really just being focused on specific opportunities and not just I'm gonna sell to the government because if that's the case, then you're just being reactive. Again, there's so much data out there, you need to really spend that time upfront to be to narrow in on the opportunities and be proactive. So you should know specifically how big is the market uh, within a particular department or agency for your specific services uh, or product or software. Uh, who are the contact people there? What are the opportunities? What's coming up that's you know nine to 12 months out where then you've got some lead time to go in and start building the relationships uh, and really focus on those. So instead of just focusing on a specific um, department or agency should really be focused on specific opportunities. And really just getting to know your customer and what their preferred method of procurement is. Okay, I'm trying to read here some of these next questions. And uh, a lot of what you're saying highlights why there are so many fewer small businesses entrants into the federal arena, GAO and USWCC say 20% um, fewer small business entrants since 2017. Yeah, it is, uh, it is competitive uh, and you need a perhaps a multi-pronged approach going direct uh, as well as um, working with some of the primes. Okay, hi, we have an active 8A certificate, how to get or apply for GSA, GWAC, uh, 8A STARS 3. Uh, solicitation should be on SAM.gov as are all solicitations. I'm not sure what the status of the STARS 3 is or what um, kind of the opener or close date is on those. And let me make sure that uh, answering all these questions. Okay, what other uh, questions does anybody have, I think? And Elizabeth, feel free to, to help me out if I missed anything here. I think you were pretty exhaustive. <laughs> okay, good. I tried to repeat just in case anybody missed them or if I went through them too fast. Uh, fast. Like one person has a question, let me see. There's two, there's two entries. Let me see if I can unmute him. <laughs> that will work. So it's self-muted, Akoka. Can you, can you unmute your mic and ask a question? I'm not sure if that'll work if you've got a microphone. Hand is raised, though. So here, I think maybe Abby, um, unmute Abby. If you want to go ahead and ask your question. We can hear you, Abby. If you want to go ahead. Maybe not. I'm going to go and mute her. <laughs> okay. uh, there's another one. Is it worth 
uh, the effort to get on GSA schedule? Well, that's a, again, cannot be a cookie cutter answer here. It's dependent upon each specific uh, company and based on how the market, what the market research data looks like uh, that you've conducted um, to find out how big the GSA market is for you or specific product, service, or software where you have relationships, uh, where you have some sort of competitive advantage. Um, looks like uh, a lot to go through and at the end you're still going to bid with lowest prices correct um that's why uh, i always enjoy giving this presentation to uh hopefully stop some companies that if it is not in their best interest that they don't go down the path because the schedule there is a cost of doing business so you want to make sure that the return on investment is there on the other side and it may be a timing issue maybe three years down the road it is uh, it, it would behoove you to pursue the schedule because uh, that's how your customers purchase and then you were able to scale your business to get your prices a little bit lower. Um, otherwise, uh, again, you know, you should uh, be able to look at data and make that decision. Uh, the cost of doing business, the cost of getting on the schedule, whether you do it yourself, you know, time is money, so there's still going to be a number associated with that. Uh, or if you hired a consultant or a consulting firm like us, um, you, know, you have to take those costs into consideration as well as post-award. Do you have somebody that's full-time that's out there to help market and uh, sell your, uh, your solution specifically through the GSA schedule and can has enough muscle and uh, persuasion skills to, uh, to move your prospects to purchase through this specific contract vehicle? And let's see. So is it worth it? Uh, that's a custom uh, answer based on data. Uh, but you guys, you know, it's easy enough to to do that homework. It may be some, you know, time consuming, but um, uh, another question here, do I have to share my lowest uh, commercial rate to GSA? Yes, yeah. so as I mentioned, you've got to open the Kimona and disclose your discounts, both standard and non-standard discounts to GSA. So who you've given your lowest prices to, and like I said, that can either be part of your standard practices, meaning that anytime you deal with nonprofits and associations, you're always giving a 10% discount, uh, or this was a one-time spot discount of 50% because we had just started the business and um, uh, wanted just you know, to generate some revenue, that would be non-standard. So you'll need to provide all of that information to GSA, uh, and then the only rates they will be concerned with are your standard discounts, which are part of your standard everyday discounting policies. And you may not have any, um, but it sounds like based on the question that uh, you have deviated from your commercial rates. I'm pricing is usually the, the section that most people get hung up on because again, the, the schedule is primarily based on pricing. Uh, if I'm looking for the same question, if there's another one. Okay, another question says, can we list job categories in the schedule that we did not use before in invoicing? Now, again, every line item that you propose is going to need a an invoice to show that you have um, that you have sold that in the past. Well, this is my preferred method. Uh, you can, if you have proposed that job title in the past, so if you have a proposal that you submitted to either an ABC company or to um, to the government, you can show that official proposal as, so if you have a, a job title, let's just say a systems engineer level six, um, at a rate of $240, um, and if you've never invoiced that, but it was part of a proposal, um, the second option that GSA will let you use behind an invoice is a proposed rate. Um, again, that's not my preferred method. I prefer uh, to have a company that, like I said, meets or exceeds uh, all of the requirements to show that, you know, yes, this is a rate that we have billed, we've sold this, we, we've been in business, um, or, um, so yeah, the, the invoice again is preferred, uh, but a proposed rate can also be shown. And the next question, uh, let's repeat. Uh, 
Okay. I'm going the wrong direction here on these questions. Bear with me. And Elizabeth, if you see any that uh, that I haven't answered, feel free to. Okay, I think you mentioned this earlier, but to confirm the GSA threshold rate apply only to the labor categories we list on this schedule. Uh, and other, okay, yeah, you. Um, so whatever labor categories you have on your GSA schedule, those are the rates that are, we'll say, uh, your price ceiling or a not to exceed rate. So. If you're bidding for work uh, outside of your schedule and it's not one of your GSA labor categories, then uh, you just get a free reign there. That's not under any kind of, we'll say, most favored uh, nation clauses. And okay. And any other questions uh, related to this or anything else that I can answer? And sorry, I realized we finished a little bit early, uh, but like I said, usually in person with uh, a whiteboard and um, some more interaction, it usually fills up the, uh, the two full hours. I don't think people mind getting left out early or to, to let out early. <laughs> okay. All right, well, if anyone else wants to raise their hand, um, we can ask questions, but otherwise, otherwise, I think we are, we're done. Okay. Thank you so much Super. for your time, Jennifer, and uh, yeah, just send me that link uh, for the recording, and I can, okay. I can send it out to everyone. I went ahead and sent the survey already, so um, if you did not get the survey, uh, I will be reconciling the attendance with anyone I missed and you'll get the survey link when I do. So um, just email me if you have any, any questions and uh, you've got Jennifer's contact information right there. Super, thank you so much, Elizabeth. And thanks everybody who attended. Uh, I realize it's dry material, so I apologize for that. But if you have any specific questions, feel free to contact me. Um, and yeah, please continue to use your PTAC as a great resource for uh, wonderful information and consulting and counseling. All right. Until next time. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.